Cloud Native, building agile microservices with the Micronaut framework. My name is Zachary Klein, and I work for Object Computing. I'm a principal software engineer. Apologize for the uh, noise there. This is a very loud stage. Um, so we're based out of St. Louis, and in addition to consulting um, and architecture and other types of things that I'm involved in, I also do some speaking and instruction uh, for uh, some of our training courses. And I'm also an occasional open source contributor uh, specifically to Grails, the Grails framework, and to the Micronaut framework, which are both frameworks that were largely sponsored by my company, OCI. And you can find me on Twitter and my email address right there. And I am here to talk to you this afternoon about Micronaut. So before I jump in here, uh, could I get a show of hands? Who here has heard of Micronaut? Okay, cool, so most of you, that's great. So what I wanna do here, and uh, this is taking a little bit, little bit of a risk, but I'm gonna jump out of my slides and I'm gonna try to do a really quick demo. I have a more full featured demo that I was hoping to save for the end, but I'm concerned I won't be able to fit it in, so I'll share the code for that one. But I'm gonna go ahead and just try to live code a brand new Micronaut application and just kind of walk you through a little bit what the development process looks like. And we'll just take a few minutes to do this before we get into uh, the core of the talk. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and try my handy keyboard shortcut here. All right, so we should now be seeing the same screen. Do you guys see my keynote there? All right, so I brought up, oops, and I apologize. Is that, is the resolution okay or is that too small? Is it all right? I'll have, the code will be zoomed in once I bring the IDE up. So I'm here on the Micronaut homepage, micronaut.io, and there's a big blue button. Oh, cool, the zoom works. Big blue launch button right here. So the best way to get started with Micronaut is to go to the Micronaut launch uh, web page, which is a really cool um, uh, project generator uh, website, and we can go ahead and choose. I'm going to choose Java 17. I'm going to call our project Hello Dev Nexus. I'm going to give it a default package, which will be objectcomputing.com. Uh, and let's see, I'm going to leave everything else at the default for now, but notice I could choose between a few different uh, versions of the framework. I could choose what language I want to use between Java, which is the default, Groovy or Kotlin. Uh, I'm just going to stick with Java here for maximum uh, familiarity. And then build tool, we can use Gradle, Gradle Kotlin or Maven, and then we could also choose a test framework. And we can also choose from a whole slew of features, which include things like JDBC drivers, uh, persistence frameworks, uh, cloud integrations, you name it. There's a lot of stuff in here uh, that, that you can add as part of this Micronaut launch experience. And I'm just gonna go ahead and generate the project and download a zip file. So now I've got my zip file. I'm gonna go ahead and bring up my terminal. Font's a little bit bigger here. And I happen to know that this went to, oops, my downloads directory. So I'm just gonna go in there. There it is. I'm gonna unzip the hello dev nexus zip file. There it is. I'm gonna CD into there. And now what I wanna do is I wanna go ahead and bring this up in my IDE, and I'm using IntelliJ here. So I'm gonna go ahead and open this. Go to my downloads directory, there it is. I'm gonna open the build.gradle file. So I'm using Gradle, which was the default. I could have chose Maven. Uh, Micronaut doesn't really have any uh, support the same year way. All right. So now I've got my project uh, loaded up here. And I'm just gonna go ahead and let me do this. I'm gonna start up the application first. So I'm gonna go down here to the command line, and I'm gonna run Gradle W, which if you're not familiar with Gradle, that's the Gradle wrapper script. And I'm gonna run it, I'm gonna run it with the dash T flag, which means that when I make changes to my source, the application is going to be reloaded um, automatically. So for now, the application should have nothing in it. So while it's launching here, there it is, it's already launched. I'll go ahead and take a look at what code we do have to look at, and we have an application class. Um, we could run the application directly from this class. It's a standard Java, uh, static void main, and then it starts up the Micronaut context and the embedded server. So let's go ahead and create a controller. So I'm gonna create a new Java class. I'm gonna call this hello controller. And I'm just gonna annotate. And those of you who are familiar with Micronaut, you've probably seen this sort of demo before, so just bear with me here. So controller, I'm gonna run it off of the hello path. And I'm going to I'm close this, by the way, so we have a little more space. And I think this is going to be a get endpoint. And it's going to be returning an HTTP response of type string. We're gonna call this hello. Doesn't take any arguments at the moment. And we're gonna return an HTTP response okay. 
and within that will be our string, which is the body of our response. All right, now a couple more things we want to do here. This would actually work, but just to make things a little nicer, we're going to go ahead and indicate that this controller method produces plain text, because by default, Micronaut assumes it's going to be a JSON, and that would, um, that would confuse our, our REST clients. Okay, so that looks pretty good. And if I save this and we go back to our terminal, let's see, we should see that it's reloaded. I think it has, let's go ahead and find out. I'm going to go ahead and jump to my browser and go to HTTP localhost. By default, it's going to be localhost 8080, hello. And there we go. So we've got our application up and running and we've exposed our first endpoint. And now I wanna do a couple more things here. Thank you all uh, for coming in. We're just in the middle of a quick live demo before I get into the main body of the presentation. So I've created a micro application. I've added a simple endpoint that returns a simple string. Let's go ahead and make this a little more interesting. We're gonna add another endpoint and to save time, it's gonna copy this as a base. This one is going to be called hello name and it's going to take a string name. And so we're gonna change the path here to include a path variable, which we'll call name. And we'll talk about these, what I'm doing here in a little more detail when we get into the talk. And now rather than just having a fixed string, I'm gonna go ahead and concatenate and greet the name like so. So save this. The application's reloading. And this endpoint here should continue to work as it did before. But if I now go ahead and add a, another path parameter here, and I put in, let's just say, Atlanta. There we go. So now, now we have our second endpoint up and running. And for our last bit for this demo, I'm gonna go ahead and actually shut the application down because now what I wanna do is I wanna test my controller, okay? So my kernel has already given me a simple test that essentially starts up the application and then asserts that it is running. And I'll talk a little more about testing with Mike or not as we get into the talk. But for now, what I wanna do is I want to create one more class. I'm gonna create a Java interface this time. I'm gonna call this hello client. And I'm gonna annotate this interface with the at client annotation. And I want this to hit the hello path. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna go and copy my method signatures from my controller and paste them straight into my interface and turn them into interface methods. Do the same thing with the second one. Now I will have to make one change here before this is able to be used. So notice that I have a produces annotation, but now I'm no longer running on the server side, I'm reading, creating a client. And so the, the corresponding annotation that I wanna use is called consumes. So this is gonna set the, the content, the uh, accepts header, right? The, as opposed to the content type. So I'm gonna change those annotations out. So now I've got a client for my controller. And if I go back to that test that Micronaut gave to me out of the box, I can now use the add inject annotation to inject my little client here. And now I'm just gonna go ahead and use the test that's already here just for sake of time. And I'm going to go ahead and say that I'm gonna have a string hello response, which is going to be the result of calling my hello client and I'll call the hello method, and then I wanna get the body out of that, out of that response. Because recall, if I go to the controller, I'm not returning a string, I'm returning an HTTP response. And the reason you do that is because that gives you access to the status code and headers and all the good stuff that goes along with the uh, response. If I just put a string there, if I made this method just return a string, that would work, but then I went, in my client, I wouldn't have the easy access to uh, the response. So I'm gonna go ahead and back to my test here, and all I want to do is I want to go ahead and pull up another assertions. I'm going to assert equals. And what we should get from our first controller method is hello dev nexus. And that should be equivalent to our hello response. And I'm just going to take it on faith that that's going to work before I put the next one in. So hello name response is the same idea, except this time we're going to go ahead and pass in a argument. We'll call this ATL jug. And now I'm gonna go ahead and add a second assertion. And this should come back with hello ATL jug. And just double check that my control, yes. So this should work. I'm gonna go ahead and run this test from within the IDE. 
We'll talk more about what I'm doing in this whole Micronaut test thing going on. It worked, okay? So what this actually did is it started up my application on a random port and it instantiated the client that I created and it invoked my application and made these assertions and everything passed. Okay, so that'll be all for the initial demo right now. I've got more to show you, but uh, we gotta get through the rest of the content and then we'll see if we have time. So commit F1 and jump back in. All right, so a little bit of history. So Micronaut has been around for a little while now. It was announced in March of 2018 and that link there is a link to the video announcement at the Greech conference. Um, it was open sourced uh, just a little bit later that year and then in October we had our first 1.0 release. And Micronaut really triggered a lot of interest and a lot of innovation around server-side JVM and how can we make Java applications that are more performant, that consume fewer resources, and that are just more efficient um, in, how, in how they're run, so runtime efficiency in particular. And so Quarkus and Spring Foo and these other projects and the improvements in Spring Boot, you can really trace all this back to what happens right after Micronaut comes out. So it really did spur on a lot of interest and a lot of ideas. Micronaut 3.0 was released in August of 21. Uh, the current major version is 3.8. And Micronaut 4.0 is expected in quarter two. So there's a nice release cadence. It's pretty dependable. Um, and let's see, Micronaut continues to point the path forwards for server-side Java frameworks. It's a big statement. I do think it's accurate. And I can try to back that up um, as we go through. Now, Micronaut, as I mentioned earlier, was sponsored by my company, Object Computing. Uh, however, it is currently stewarded by the Micronaut Foundation, which is a uh, not-for-profit organization that has representatives from a lot of major uh, uh, companies, JetBrains, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, as well as Object Computing. Um, and that really serves to steer the framework and, and uh, kind of uh, keep, keep things accountable and keep things moving along. Who's using Micronaut? Um, some large companies that you may have heard of, including uh, Minecraft, Target, Samsung, uh, SmartThings um, subsidiary. Um, and there's more, of course, but these are ones that we have permission to uh, put their names out publicly. So it is, get, it is certainly picking up in adoption. Uh, people are finding it to be a very effective framework for building microservices, for building serverless applications, serverless functions, and so forth. So before I go into what is Micronaut, I wanna talk about what some of the goals of the framework. So Micronaut was designed with the cloud in mind, with microservices in mind. Um, some of you may know that the team that built Micronaut was also behind the framework called Grails, which was based on Spring and Spring Boot. And one of the things that spurred on the development of Micronaut was some frustration that um, with Spring Boot as our base, it was not as effective in uh, cloud environments as we hoped. And so, um, there were some major refactoring and improvements that were being considered, and finally it was decided that it made more sense to build a new framework with the cloud and with microservices in mind. And so the big, the big uh, features then of Micronaut are a very fast startup time and a very low memory footprint, because those are the two pain points that we were running into. Both of these are largely accomplished by avoiding Java reflection, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. Uh, the, the executable jar file is very small, and, and again, we'll talk about this more in a little bit, but Micronaut uses ahead of time compilation, so it minimizes how much Micronaut is actually part of your runtime. So you have a very small runtime, very small jar file. Most of the interesting stuff that the framework has to do is done through ahead of time compilation when you're building your application rather than when you're running it. Okay, so with that as a bit of backdrop and goals, Micronaut is a framework, a Java framework for building microservices and serverless apps, okay? It leverages ahead of time compilation, as I said, and that's done to support dependency injection. It supports aspect-oriented programming, which you may or may not use directly in your application, but many of the features like caching and service discovery and other things that Micronaut supports, it's using AOP and some of these other tools under the covers. Um, and then code introspection, so Micronaut is able to build metadata about your classes, which can then be used by framework features or by your own code, and it's doing this all when your application is being compiled. So you have access to that metadata um, even when your application, uh, without, without having to essentially inspect your application through reflection while it's up and running or while it's starting up. Uh, because it's built with microservices first and foremost in mind, uh, Micronaut does have a reactive HTTP layer, layer which is based on the Netty server, declarative HTTP client, which we just saw in our little live coding demonstration, 
And then, as I, you saw in the launch uh, demo, there's a whole bunch of Micronaut integrations, libraries for supporting all sorts of third-party frameworks and tools uh, that you can optionally add into your, your application. And the reason why that's significant, of course, this is a Java framework, so if you've got a Java dependency, you can include it, you can use it. You can use Hibernate, you can use you know, anything that should work in a Java application, you can use it in a Micronaut. But the Micronaut integrations that are built by the team and they're built uh, by the community, uh, wherever possible, we are leveraging that same ahead of time compilation wherever we can. So we're trying to, min and sometimes the frameworks that we uh, integrate with, uh, like Hibernate, for example, they don't necessarily let us go as far as we like, but we go as far as we can to minimize what has to be done at startup time and what has to be done at runtime. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go forward. Micronaut is build tool ag agnostic, it's testing framework agnostic. Um, you can pretty much use it with any set of tooling that you like. Uh, there are Maven and Gradle plugins for Micronaut that, um, that are officially supported. Um, and so that's what you'll be seeing in, in this presentation, but it's not really build tool dependent. Um, and then as the title says, we, it's a natively cloud native framework. And, and what do we mean by that? Um, Micronaut, again, because it was designed with microservices in mind, there are a lot of just kind of basic needs that microservices and cloud-based services have um, that Micronaut more or less takes for granted. And so there are built-in constructs in the framework to handle things like service discovery, distributed configuration, load balancing, um, there's dedicated serverless computing support, and that gets a little trickier because that's very dependent on the cloud framework. But pretty much all the major cloud providers and their serverless um, offerings are supported by Micronaut. AWS Lambda, Google Cloud Functions, and Azure Functions, and so forth. Distributed tracing, token propagation, and there's lots more, event-driven uh, architecture, all that kind of stuff. So those things are just natural features, whether they're included in Micronaut Core or they're in one of the libraries that you can choose when you create your application. Um, this is something that's very much in the ethos of Micronaut. This is what it was designed to do. As opposed to, um, and this is not to put down other frameworks, but traditional Java frameworks largely predate the cloud and they predate this whole distributed architecture um, and serverless and so forth. Micronaut was designed with all those lessons learned and all of those goals in mind. Now that being said, what can you build with the Micronaut framework? Obviously microservices and serverless applications are what I've been primarily referencing. Uh, you can also build event-driven or message-driven applications. Um, so you can have applications that run on, let's say, Apache Kafka, and they may not even need an HTTP server. There may not be any uh, HTTP traffic going on at all besides uh, interacting with Kafka consumers and producers. So you can create message uh, or event-driven applications uh, with Kafka and other, other messaging tools. You can build CLI applications, again, without needing HTTP server. Uh, Android applications, same idea. And really anything that can be done in Java, you can use Micronaut. So even though Micronaut as a framework, kind of if you just create a, your standard Micronaut application, it's cloud native, right? Natively cloud native. Uh, you can use the core bits of Micronaut, dependency injection, configuration, AOP, without any HTTP stuff involved at all. And so it really can go anywhere. And we've seen people use this uh, for IoT-based applications. Um, I was gonna demo this, but it ended up being a little too contrived. But I have a, a Linux-based uh, smartphone, which I've installed Micronaut on, uh, just as a, a fun little demo for myself. Um, so it can run on very low, uh, uh, very constrained uh, resources. And again, if you can build it in Java, you can leverage Micronaut, even if you're not necessarily building a web service per se. So why is Micronaut, uh, what is it bringing to the table then? I've already alluded to this a few times that Java itself and traditional Java frameworks were not designed with the cloud in mind. And most of the mainstream solutions for dependency injection and these other more uh, complex uh, framework features, they tend to make a lot of use of runtime processing like reflection, uh, like runtime caches and so forth. And that is not ideal when you are running in a resource constrained environment uh, where your application may not be running all the time, you can't just throw memory at it, you're paying for resource usage, you're not just paying for a box with a set number of resources. So there's a lot of things where the, the JVM and the, and the traditional frameworks that are built around it, they were not designed with this kind of environment um, in, in, the, in their minds. And again, it's no fault of their own, this is a, a new world that we're living in. Um, 
let's see, I'm not sure where that's going there. So the big uh, problem here that, that was really what drove the, the development of Micronaut was reflection. We really wanted to get away from Java reflection. So when you're actually inspecting your code or the framework is inspecting your code at runtime, the Grails framework does a lot of this um, to provide a lot of the features that it, that, it, that it does. And so without going into all the technical details here because we don't have time, the ahead of time compilation, what it does is instead of waiting for the application to be launched and then inspecting your application and building up caches and, and essentially uh, learning what's in your application, where your transactions need to be, where your caching needs to happen. Micronaut does all that same kind of work, but it does it when your application is being compiled. So there's a library, Micronaut Inject, which will essentially use annotation processing. So Micronaut is a very annotation-driven framework. Um, and it will analyze your code, and it will build up metadata. It will build up um, the information that it needs to then generate bytecode that does things like caching and providing transactions and so forth, or pre-computing uh, SQL qu queries, for example, if you're using Micronaut data. The generated bytecode lives in the same package as your source code, so it's able to access private variables and so forth. But your own code, the code that you write, the classes that you write, are not modified or transformed in any way by Micronaut. And that's a, something that's a little bit different than some of the other uh, AOT type of, uh, of solutions that are out there. Um, I don't want to spend too much time here on Growl VM, but I just want to mention it briefly here. Growl VM, has anyone, who's familiar with Growl VM in this room? Okay, a few of you are. So just very high level, it's a high performance Java development kit uh, that among other things allows you to generate something called a native image, which is essentially a binary executable file with, it's very lightweight, it's specific to the architecture you build it on, so you're kind of giving up the build once, you know, a run anywhere sort of thing. Uh, but it's extremely performant, and it does not support reflection very well. That's part of how it's able to be uh, so lightweight. And so Micronaut is officially ready for native images, and it was before GraalVM really uh, was uh, uh, getting a lot of attention because Micronaut was already moving away from reflection. GraalVM then provides an even higher performance uh, option for the JVM, especially for frameworks like Micronaut that can avoid reflection. So GraalVM loves Micronaut, they go along re really well together, and if I have time, my last demo does demonstrate using GraalVM. And if you want to learn a little bit more about some of the technical details of why Micronaut and GraalVM work so well together, this presentation by Graham Roche, who uh, was formerly my colleague at OCI, he now works at Oracle, Oracle Labs, um, he goes into a little bit in this webinar from the Oracle folks. So I want to look at the components here of a Micronaut app. So we were looking at a project earlier, and I mentioned the Micronaut Inject, which is the core library that does this ahead of time compilation. There's then your runtime, and this is going to give you an application context so that you can have dependency injection, so you can uh, load configuration. And then we mentioned that there's this reactive HTTP layer based on Netty for both your controller, your server, and your client, and then there's all these other libraries. Um, and by the way, you can actually deploy Micronaut to a servlet container. There's support for that now. Um, so if you want to build a war file and drop in the Tomcat like we used to do, you can still do that with Micronaut, um, but that's not typically the way we see it used. Um, things I want to point out here are that the Micronaut inject and runtime can be used anywhere you're using Java. So when I say you can use Micronaut literally anywhere you have static void main and you're writing Java code, that's what I'm talking about. You can use the annotation processing, you can use the Micronaut runtime to load configuration to build an application that has nothing to do with web services at all. Okay, so there's, there's very general purpose features that you can use um, just to make a Java library that doesn't even necessarily know about you know, REST services. Uh, when you build a micro application like we just did, when you download it from the website, you do get the HTTP layer because by default, we kind of assume you're gonna create a microservice. Now, if you look closely, the, app, the launch wizard, Micronaut Launch, does let you choose between a few different application types. So you're not limited even there to the standard microservice, uh, but that is our default. Um, and you can also choose your build tool, as I said previously, so you have the choice between Maven and Gradle as far as official Micronaut build plugins. And then you've got all the other stuff that's gonna vary depending on your, your needs, right? If you're using Kafka, if you're using Cassandra, if you're using um, caching for uh, various providers and so forth, if you're building for a particular cloud environment, there's all these other libraries and configurations. And the reason why we build all these is because we're trying to apply ahead of time compilation everywhere we can, okay? You can use stock uh, 
uh, SDKs and Java libraries, you know, just so you get from Maven Central and so forth. Um, but the Micronaut specific integrations, where possible, are going to provide ahead of time compilation support and minimize your runtime overhead, even from using those libraries. So as I said previously, the best place you can start is the Micronaut launch website. And we've got dark mode, as we saw. Uh, if you use IntelliJ, um, there's actually, if you use the ultimate version of IntelliJ, there's actually a Micronaut uh, launch wizard built into the project creation. So whether you're using the IDE or you're using Micronaut launch, um, another tool that we recommend is SDK Man, uh, which there's so much of a talk on SDK Man because it's an awesome tool for Java developers. Um, there's a, a distribution for Homebrew and Mac ports if you're on Mac, and of course it's open source, so you can always just go and download the source yourself and build it. So a few highlights of features from Micronaut. Some of these we saw in the demo. Uh, Non-blocking HTTP server. So because it's based on because Micronaut's HTTP functionality is based on Netty, which is a reactive HTTP server, by default, all the HTTP traffic in Micronaut is non-blocking. Now, in my, my demo, I didn't use any non-blocking or reactive types. Uh, when you do that, it just gets converted for you automatically. It's not a problem. Uh, but you can use non-blocking types uh, for a, a truly reactive um, programming experience. Um, the Micronaut controllers uh, are annotated with at controller, as we saw previously. And uh, within the path uh, of either the controller or your various endpoints, you can use uh, this expression language, uh, which should be pretty familiar to you if you built stuff with Spring Boot and so forth. Um, to specify query parameters and optional path variables and so forth. So you have a lot of option there for, uh, options for how you set up your um, API endpoints. This is an example of a, a reactive controller. I cannot see the screen. Is that code legible at all for people? Is it? Okay, great. Um, so uh, this is just show, so we're using uh, uh, reactive types here. Uh, Micronaut can use pretty much any reactive impl implementation. Um, so Rx, Java, Reactor, and so forth. Um, and so this is actually code that is in my last demo. So either you'll see it when I demo it or you can check the code out yourself. Uh, but it's a controller that is going to use an, a Micronaut client to interact with the GitHub API and load a streaming JSON uh, response of, of uh, GitHub uh, of releases from a particular project. The declarative HTTP client. So Micronaut's HTTP client, you can, pro you can imperatively create a client and give it a URL and add in your request parameters and your cookies and your headers and all that kind of thing, right? Um, and that's, that's the, what we call the low-level HTTP client in Micronaut. But the really cool feature are these declarative interfaces. So Micronaut allows you to create an interface, you annotate it with the client annotation, and basically anything about the client, as far as you know, headers, like I said, cookies, um, uh, query parameters, um, multi-part file uploads or downloads or what have you, all of that can be specified through annotations and through Micronauts' analyzing of your method signature. And at compile time, all of the HTTP logic is being built for you, okay? So this interface is implemented for you by Micronaut when the application is compiled, as opposed to being introspected at runtime and then after the fact, the framework having to sort of uh, put together this uh, maybe a proxy uh, to support your HTTP requests. This is all pre-computed for you. Um, I've already mentioned some of these uh, points already, so I'll just kind of uh, pass over. Oh, one thing I'll mention is uh, the, the client does support service discovery. So we can't see that in this example because I'm not using service discovery, um, but the next example I can. So this is again a snippet from my last demo. So this is going to be an HTTP client that's calling the GitHub API. Uh, to retrieve releases from a particular GitHub organization and project. So you can see we've got annotations to set certain headers. And notice how our client annotation, in my previous examples, it was always pointing to some sort of a URI. Now it just has an ID. That ID is a service ID. So this is already set up for service discovery, okay? Now that service discovery could come from multiple places. It could be coming from a dedicated service discovery server like console. It could be coming from Kubernetes. In this particular demo, it's actually being hard-coded. I've got configuration that says this service ID goes to these URLs. Um, but that's just built into the Micronaut uh, HTTP client. So you can target any running service. You don't need to know where it's actually running so long as you have the service discovery provider that recognizes that ID and is able to provide you at runtime with the proper, um, the proper path. 
And actually, uh, both these code examples are coming from one of our Micronaut guides, and I'll mention the guides again later on, uh, called JSON streams using the Micronaut HTTP client. All of our guides, wherever possible, are multi-language, and they also are multi-build tools. So it's really cool. You can actually choose if you want Gradle or Maven, and then you can choose between the three official supported languages, uh, Java, Kotlin, and Groovy. And the guide will automatically render with your preferred language and build tool uh, in the examples. So it's a pretty cool uh, uh, website to check out just, uh, just on its own. Uh, let's see, let's go ahead and take a look at testing. So I mentioned Micronaut uh, test, this annotation that we saw in the first, the opening demo. So when we annotate a class, and, and this is supported for both JUnit 5 uh, as well as Spock. So both of those are the two testing frameworks that we support with Micronaut test. And before I talk more about that, I just want to emphasize again, Micronaut is test framework agnostic. It's just, it's just, classes in a Java application. You can instantiate them yourself, you can start up the application context, and you can just make assertions. You can mock things and so forth. It's, it's not, you don't need to have a special annotation. The Micronaut test annotation, what it does for you is it actually launches the application for you on a random port, and then when your test's complete, it shuts down the application for you. That's pretty much all it's doing, although a few more convenient features it adds, uh, you can directly inject beams in your, in your application context, right into your test. So in the example I have here, I'm using the add inject keyword, and this is essentially what I did in our test during the live code uh, demo. I'm injecting a hello client beam, uh, which must exist somewhere, um, you know, off camera here obviously, uh, but I can inject it directly into my test and now I can use it in my test method. And I can inject any other controller or client or any other beam that I've created, or I can inject configuration uh, directly into my test. So that's what Micronaut test is letting you do. It just gives you a much more fluid experience when you're testing with Micronaut, and then of course it starts it up and shuts it down for you. But it's optional. You don't need to use Micronaut test, and in fact, there are times where you don't really need that functionality. You really do want to just start up the application context directly and manipulate it and, you know, as, as according to your testing needs. And of course, if you're doing unit tests, then you don't need to necessarily start it up at all. You can just, uh, um, just write your unit test. There's not really anything um, too Micronaut specific about it. Okay, let's talk a bit about dependency injection. So I mentioned that a couple times. So one of the big core features of Micronaut is this full feature dependency injection container. Uh, we use the, what was, what, what was once Java X injected, now Jakarta.inject annotations. And Micronaut is fully compatible with the uh, JSR 330, which defines how to use these uh, dependency injection annotations. And you can use the annotations directly like we saw, or you can use constructor, annota uh, constructor injection. Um, and we'll look at the comparison for that here. Um, again, just gonna repeat this bit because I think it's really important, right? What Micronaut is doing is it's analyzing and building up your dependency injection uh, container essentially at compile time. Now it's not instantiating everything at compile time, of course, but it's figuring out who depends on what and what needs to be injected with this bit of configuration, what has to be started up before this and uh, your post-construct and your pre-destroy, all that kind of stuff. It's all being analyzed during compilation and then new bytecode is being generated to provide what the framework magic, if you will, the, the actual stuff that the framework does to help, to, to help you and to provide those features. And that's all generated uh, without modifying or transforming your code in any way. So your bytecode is directly coming from the classes you wrote, but there's additional classes, bean definitions and so forth that are created alongside of those. Um, so as I was saying earlier, you can inject uh, beans with the add inject annotation, as we see here, um, into a private uh, field, for example. Or you can uh, use constructor injection, uh, where you just define a constructor, and it's nice, straightforward. We're all familiar with uh, doing that through a constructor. Um, we do recommend this approach, by the way. Um, even though the add inject keyword, I use a lot in demos because it's just so easy. Um, it's a little more flexible when you use constructor injection. So I could instantiate this controller, for example, myself, and I could, uh, you know, I could manipulate the message helper or whatever. I, I have the option of overriding the injection that the Micronaut context would have done for me otherwise. So it can be useful at tests sometimes, um, but it's, it's up to you. Uh, either way is perfectly appropriate. Um, other features related to dependency injection, uh, conditional beans. So you could specify requirements 
on beans, and by a bean, that could be a controller, it could be a client, and it could be just a singleton bean that you create to interact with some API or, or, or SDK or what have you, or just have wrapping your business logic, right, in some sort of a service class. And all of these can be annotated with a whole set of annotations, and one of them is this requires annotation, and I've got a, a selection of examples. These are all stackable, so you really could have all of these requirements on one class if you wanted to, but you could require particular properties to be set or to be not set, you can require a particular environment to be present. You can require um, a particular version of Java. You can require a particular class to be uh, available before you, this uh, application, this uh, bean is instantiated. Um, you can also uh, specify that a particular bean replaces another one. Okay, so this is really useful in tests. You can create mock versions of, of clients. Uh, for example, maybe you have a client like we just saw there, a GitHub client but we don't want to run the actual GitHub client when we uh, run our tests. We don't want to be you know, hitting the API directly. So we could create a mock version of the client that just returns a default response and set it to require uh, the test environment, for example, and then set it to replace the actual client. And Micronaut will detect that and will load the appropriate uh, bean for us uh, at, at uh, runtime. So replaceable beans are a really powerful feature. Um, Pre-construct, pre-destroy, pretty much all the standard things you can think about. I haven't even gotten to like bean factories and so forth. All the standard dependency injection, injection constructs that many of us are used to, especially if we come from a background in Spring, um, all those kinds of features are supported with Micronaut. Um, but again, without using any runtime reflection, without using any uh, runtime uh, introspection of, of your classes. Uh, everything is being done for you at compilation time. Uh, with Micronaut. Okay, I'm going to talk a bit about application configuration now, um, and we can hopefully see this in the next demo if I have time here. Micronaut supports configuration from all sorts of formats and all sorts of sources. Out of the box, you can uh, inject configuration from properties files. YAML is our default that we uh, use. Uh, you can also use JSON, um, and if you are using Groovy, if Groovy is on the class path, you can actually use Groovy uh, configuration. And if any, has anyone here used Groovy, by the way? Anyone? Okay, a few people. So Groovy actually is really powerful for configuration, especially if you've got like some programmatic stuff that has to happen in your config, uh, which we can debate if that's a good idea or not, but you can do that. And Micronaut will support Groovy-based uh, configuration uh, if, you have the, uh, if you have Groovy uh, in your project. And you could also have configuration that is specific to a particular environment. And that doesn't just mean test and development and prod. Um, Micronaut detects environments um, for example, it, Micronaut is aware of what cloud environment it's running on. So if you, if you have a cloud run or compute engine application, Micronaut knows that it's in GCP. It's in the GCP environment. And that means you can have cloud platform specific configuration files um, that will be loaded only when that environment is actually being uh, detected. And uh, that's an option, by the way, you could turn off environment detection. Um, that you get a little bit of a performance be benefit actually if you do that at startup time. Um, but by default, you do have, uh, um, I shouldn't say by default, but you do have environment uh, detection going on, and that allows you to have uh, even more tailored uh, specific configuration files. That's a bit of an example of what a default uh, YAML configuration file looks like. To use the configuration, you can inject properties through um, the at value annotation. It's probably the most straightforward way to do it. You just give it a, uh, this expression that gives you the key path, or you give it the key path of that config property. And there's an example here of us doing that within a controller. There's also a set of uh, configuration properties that Micronaut creates for you that are essentially random values. So you can create a random, get a random uh, available port. You can get a random integer or long value. You can get a random UUID. Um, you know, that's just available for you if you want to inject those random uh, properties. They, they are just there. Um, and there's an example here. Of we're basically creating an instance ID for our application and we're taking advantage of the, the random config property to do that. Um, now, besides configuration files and all that, of course, Micronaut is cloud native, and so it supports all the various distributed configuration uh, options that you would expect. Um, so it can, of course, load, load configuration from environment variables, so you can have environment variables in your cloud uh, app, in your uh, cloud run service, for example, and those will get picked up. Uh, but it also works with uh, the various distributed uh, configuration uh, solutions that are out there. So you can you can work with, um, and I forget the names of all, all of them right now, but AWS, Google, um, 
spring cloud configuration. All of these, are, uh, console is another one that I've got up there. Um, the way this works is it literally just merges your application configuration with any other configuration sources it detects. So it starts up, it will de detect whatever configuration is available to it, and then it will merge that all to create the actual application configuration. There's more to be said about this. Of course, uh, there's a whole set of annotations that allow you to build up um, uh, more complex objects to represent configuration. So configuration properties and uh, you have the ability to iterate over sets of configurations. So you've, if you have multiple, let's say, multiple data sources in some cloud config somewhere and they're nested in some sort of a structure that's, that's um, a list, right? So you can iterate over them. Um, you would iterate, you could iterate using uh, uh, the, the each property and the each bean annotation and create these configuration objects that you can then inject into some other bean and now you have access to your JDBC information, for example, uh, for a database connection. Uh, it's a really cool feature, but unfortunately I don't have time to show it off here right now. Myconaut supports, uh, ma uh, provides management endpoints, and so this would be things like health checks and um, just information about your application, what beans are loaded and so forth. Um, you can see a couple example of the beans uh, endpoint here, as well as the default health check. Um, and of course, you can implement your own health checks, which will then get picked up by this endpoint. Um, if you use for uh, other, other Micronaut um, libraries that you include can add health checks as well. So for example, uh, my last project was all based on Apache Kafka. And the Micronaut Kafka library, once you add it, and we'll actually see a couple of examples of this later on, of um, Micronaut Kafka, um, it creates a health check for Kafka. And it even creates a health check for Kafka streams if you're using Kafka streams. And it loads a whole bunch of really helpful information right into that health endpoint for you. Um, so, you, and you can provide your own, of course. So you can provide your own uh, system uh, checks and, and they'll be included in, in the, the health endpoint. So uh, besides uh, health and beans I've already mentioned, uh, there's a routes endpoint, uh, there's a stop, there's loggers. Loggers is cool, you can change your log levels at runtime. Uh, that's a really uh, useful feature that we've, uh, I've, I've had a chance to take advantage of. Application metrics, uh, environment, which gives you all of your currently resolved uh, configuration properties, so it gives you that whole merge configuration tree is going to show up there so you can see uh, what's actually been loaded. That's all part of the Micronaut management library. Micronaut service discovery, so you do have to add the discovery client uh, to your application to enable this, but once you do that, you can give your application a service ID, which by default is just going to be your application name uh, from your, your app config. And in this case, this is an example showing us using console. So we're, we're pointing the application to a console server, and when the application starts up, it'll register itself with console, and it will be known by the service ID. And of course, other applications, other clients can now re make requests against that application, and console will take care of, of exchanging and providing the current uh, URI that needs to be uh, hit. Uh, we've got caching in Micronaut, so the cacheable annotation. Uh, there's a number of backends that are available to you, Redis, EHCache, and so forth. Um, but the use case is very straightforward. You've just got, got your cacheable annotation to uh, say that this particular method, uh, based on the argument, so by default, it's going to create a key based on the method arguments, and then it'll cache that result so that subsequent calls to that method will return the cache version instead of executing the method. And of course, you can customize that. You can you know, have your own uh, key generation strategy and so forth. Um, as, you, as you see fit. And you've got annotations to invalidate the cache, to add, uh, add entries to the cache, and so forth. There's a schedule annotation for uh, processes that need to be run in the background at a particular uh, regularity, and you can set that using cron or through a, a, a fixed uh, delay period. All of these, by the way, can be set through configuration as well. So you don't have to have it hard-coded in, in your code here. This could be in a configuration file or an environment variable somewhere. Um, something that's very important in a cloud environment, uh, because we are talking about a distributed system where things don't always respond the first time, and uh, you do have connectivity issues and so forth at times, uh, we can annotate a method as retriable. And there's some uh, options there as far as exactly what kind of retriable strategy you want to use, uh, but essentially what will happen is that um, that method will be, if it fails, if it throws an exception and doesn't return the expected result, It'll be reattempted a certain number of times, followed by a delay, which can also be configured. 
Um, and that will essentially control how many times you, you, you want to uh, retry this method. Very useful when you're making a call to you know, a database or to some external resource that may not be initially available, but you have reason to believe it will become available if you give it a couple more shots. Now, retriable is helpful, but you run the risk of actually overloading a downstream resource, right? And so we have a circuit breaker annotation, which is built on top of retriable, but it adds um, this uh, concept that once the max number of attempts have been exceeded, rather than continuing to execute the method and continuing to pound that downstream resource that is already struggling for whatever reason, it will instead return the exception that was last returned by uh, the failed call. And it does it immediately. So it essentially backs off, it stops calling that method, stops the execution, and just returns the exception so you can capture it, capture it, catch it rather, and handle it however you see fit until the uh, reset period expires. At that point, then it will begin to retry once again. So that's the circuit breaker annotation. Uh, distributed tracing, that's another really important feature in uh, cloud environments and microservices in particular. Um, does anyone, are we all familiar with, with distributed tracing? Is that a new term to anybody? I see some heads nodding. Uh, I see one shaking though. So just in brief, distributed tracing essentially, uh, you have to have some sort of a service that's doing this, that's keeping track of the data. But it basically is uh, allowing you to uh, create a map or a trace of a flow of execution through multiple services, um, including within one service. So it doesn't have to necessarily even be multiple microservices. You might have one method uh, that, or a method that, that calls another method, and you can make that a span on your trace. And that would show up then as, okay, this method execution took that long, and then we call this. And there's metadata you can add to your trace and so forth. It's a really powerful way of, of getting a holistic view of a distributed system like a microservice architecture uh, because logs only tell you so much. And uh, distributed tracing is essentially a, a next level on logging, if I could oversimplify a little bit, uh, that takes into account the distributed nature of what you're doing. So Micronaut has support for distributed tracing um, for pretty much anything that's based on the open tracing uh, uh, specification. And there's a set of annotations that help you with this. So you can annotate a method with new span, and that means that that will show up as a segment in your trace. By default, whenever you make a REST request and you call out to another service, uh, Micronaut, if, it's, if distributed tracing is turned on, it's going, to, it's going to continue that trace across to that next request. And so that request will be a segment. It'll be a span in your trace but you can make them much more granular, right? You can have that at the method level, you can create them programmatically and say, I wanna do this little you know, while loop and I wanna add a trace segment after that. So you have a lot of power in what you want your trace to look like. And then once you've collected this data, this data, you can then load it into the user interface of whatever tracing tool you happen to be using. This is a screenshot from Jaeger uh, on a Micronaut uh, application. And you can see uh, kind of a sense of what this looks like. So we've got the single trace with multiple uh, requests that were part of satisfying it, and all of that metadata is captured there uh, by the tracing uh, server. Um, Open API is a pretty standard uh, specification for defining API documentation, uh, which can be which Micronaut is able to do this because Micronaut's analyzing your code anyways, which means Micronaut knows about all your controllers, it knows about all your response types and your method arguments and your headers and everything else, all there in the same code that's being analyzed at, at compile time. And so Micronaut can take that and actually build out OpenAPI uh, YAML files. So it can build out this, this, um, this API documentation. And this is actually in my demo as well. It, so you'll get to see it, at very least you'll see it in the code sample. Um, and uh, Micronaut also supports uh, static resources which means you can actually load HTML and CSS and images uh, from, you can serve them rather from a Micronaut application. And if you turn that on for uh, Swagger and a couple more configuration options that, I, that we can talk about, uh, you can actually expose the uh, user interface uh, that, that Swagger provides that basically reads in your open API and then creates this really nice interactive documentation website where you can type in stuff and invoke your, your endpoints and so forth. So that's open API and Swagger. Uh, Micronaut Data is a persistence framework uh, for, built specifically for Micronaut. So again, with Micronaut, you don't need to use a dedicated 
persistence library that's specific to Micronom. You could just use Hibernate. You can just use raw JDBC, whatever, whatever you want to do. You can use Spring Data. You can use, um, if you're in the Grails world, you can use GORM, which is the persistence uh, framework uh, for Grails. Um, but Micronaut Data is trying to give you all those persistence features like transactions and, 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 um, and you know, computation of queries and so forth, but it's doing all of that for you at compilation time. Um, or it's doing all the work, anyways, around compilation time. So it's, it's doing this uh, with as little reflection as possible. Um, its basic job, really, is to compute queries. Okay, so you, you define, a, a, and we'll see a code example in a minute, but you define an interface that has methods that follow a certain convention, and Micronaut, is, Micronaut data is able to read that and then at comp compilation time, and then it computes a SQL query or update or insert or what have you. Um, there's two different versions of Micronaut data currently, or two major versions. Uh, there is no SQL support in Micronaut data, but it's a little bit newer. Uh, but the, the two uh, main uh, flavors of Micronaut data are JPA, which is built on top of Hibernate, which means there is a little more runtime overhead because Hibernate itself uh, requires that. Um, but again, wherever possible, Micronaut Data tries to uh, minimize that. But the great thing about Micronaut Data JPA is that if, if, it's, got, if it's got Hibernate support, um, the Hibernate dialect, then you can use it. So you have really wide compatibility. Micronaut Data JDBC provides a similar programming experience um, but it, is, it doesn't use Hibernate, and so it is much more efficient at runtime. Um, and this is the option we like to recommend unless you really need something that comes from Hibernate. Uh, we like to encourage folks to try JDBC first because it is a lot more efficient and is fully ahead of time compiled. Um, little comparison table there, we can skip that for now. This is what a Micronaut data entity looks like. So it's a POJO with some uh, standard annotations, mapped entity, we have a, a generated ID there. And then we can create an interface, so similar to what we do for HTTP clients, right? We can create an interface that is our data repository. Um, and in this case, we are extending um, something called CRUD repository, which is an interface that Micronaut Data provides, and it just gives you all the standard, you know, insert, update, find, find all. Uh, it gives you some standard, um, well, CRUD-based uh, uh, data access and persistence methods out of the box. Notice that we have to specify the dialect in the annotation. Now, why is that? Why can't we have that be a configuration property? Because Micronaut Data is going to be computing MySQL specific SQL queries at compilation time. So it needs to know the dialect up front. That's a, it's, it's, a, it's a minor thing. It catches people off guard sometimes, but it's actually useful because it reminds you that's actually what Micronauts are doing. It needs to know if this is Postgres or MySQL or some other um, database that's supported by Micronaut Data because it's going to actually be computing those queries that are defined by this interface. Now, of course, we may not be happy with simply the, the default CRUD uh, methods that are provided, and so we can define our own. And there are a few different examples here. I just want to call it the last couple uh, there. So we have list car. So we have some entity called car, and our method is find all by make. Um, actually, there's a, a typo there. It should be find all by make and model. <laughs> Turns out Keynote is not a great IDE. Um, I should have uh, double checked that. Uh, should have been make and model. But the point here is that Micronaut is actually able to read a method that follows this sort of uh, convention of find all by property name and this property name. And even more complicated queries like find all by property name greater than, you know, and then you pass in an argument saying here is the, the number that it must be greater than, for example. So it's able to do a lot just by reading the method names if they follow this particular convention um, and then computing the query for you based on the arguments that you provided and based on your return type. Um, it's also smart enough to know when you are not returning an entire entity. So if you just have a particular um, subset of queries from your table that you want to query, you can put that subset of properties into a DTO and say this method returns the DTO um, yeah, I don't have a great, great example of this in the slide here. And Micronaut will be smart enough to create the query that just retrieves those properties that you actually are interested in. Um, and this, it, it goes for joins and other, other types of, you know, more complicated SQL queries. And of course, if you can't get it done with this, these convention-driven method names and such, you can use, a, there's an at query annotation, you can put in the raw SQL yourself if you need to have more direct control. Micronaut security, we'll talk about that in detail, but all the basic security things you would expect, like um, uh, HTTP, HTTP basic auth, session-driven authentication, 
Um, OAuth, all the various OAuth providers, there's integrations available for all of those. Micronaut Kafka, I mentioned that already, so I'm just gonna breeze right over it. I uh, just wanna say that I worked on a project, I used this heavily, and I mean, it was, it was so smooth. Like the, the experience, we had challenges building a big, complicated, event-driven system, but creating a producer and creating a consumer and standing up a bunch of services that started communicating with each other over Kafka, a breeze. Um, it's a really nice integration. And of course, with all these integrations, you, you always have access to the underlying framework itself. So if you do need to create your own consumer and do something really spe specific, you can do that. Um, but the, the common use cases are often covered by Micronauts annotations. And there was a presentation given at Confluence uh, Kafka Summit Conference a couple years ago uh, that uh, gave a nice demo of Kafka and Micronaut and uh, AWS Lambda. Okay, so we're in the cloud talks uh, track. So I had to, I, I wanted to actually have a live demonstration of deploying to cloud, Google Cloud Run. That was what I was going to do. Unfortunately, my computer and Docker are not friends right now. And so, plus, given the time constraint, I'm just gonna go ahead and kind of walk you through what this looks like. Uh, Micronaut has cloud provider specific features, so features are those things you can choose from the Micronaut launch website for all of the major cloud providers. So Amazon, Google, Oracle, Microsoft. Um, and so the example here I was going to go through was gonna be using uh, Cloud Run. Uh, we do have Micronaut guides available, by the way, for all of these cloud providers, so you can get really step-by-step -step instructions for how to go about this. Um, and honestly, most of it is not even Micronaut specific, right? It's just you're deploying a Java application, essentially. Um, and so I'm just gonna go ahead and breeze through these and not go through each detail, but the, the gist of it is that, going past the code here, we've already seen this kind of code, is you're, you're going to instantiate, you know, set up your, your cloud environment uh, correctly. In this case, we're using Google, so we have to authenticate. And here's the interesting part. We actually are, are deploying this, this is cloud run, so we deploy it as, as a container. So we actually um, have to configure Google um, and Docker so that Docker is able to push an image to Google Cloud Registry. So we're actually gonna create a Docker container from our Micron application and push it up to Google's container registry. And then uh, we have a little bit of configuration on the Gradle side, just to give the name of the Docker build we wanna create. And there's already a, so when you use the, 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 um, the GCP feature, you will get this uh, Docker push command that will essentially push that container image up to the container registry. And then you just run it with uh, G Cloud. And if you aren't running on an M1 MacBook Pro, it'll work great. Um, and then you can, of course, invoke your Google Cloud Run application. So that all does work. I just couldn't get it working on my particular hardware at the moment. So in summary, and I know we're just by a time here, Micronaut is a full-featured framework. It is designed for the cloud. It's not specific to the cloud. You can use the underlying bits of Micronaut anywhere you can use Java, but it is definitely designed for cloud-native architecture. That's why we've got service discovery, retriable, circuit breakers, these are all features that are designed with cloud computing and distributed architecture in mind. Um, Micronaut is actively being developed. Uh, 4.0 is supposed to come out in quarter two, I believe. Um, and you can learn more. I'll show you a resource to learn more about what's coming next. Micronaut's community is growing and very helpful. And we like to hang out on Gitter. So there's a Gitter channel um, that you can interact with the core development team members as well as lots of community folks a bunch of websites or web pages that are useful to look at. Um, and also a couple of podcasts I just wanted to mention. Uh, there's a Micronaut podcast, which is a really excellent uh, uh, podcast put together by a colleague of mine, Sergio Delamo. Um, and another podcast, and uh, the guy is actually, he's not in this room, but he's around here somewhere, Ken Cousin. Uh, the Groovy podcast. Now, Groovy and Micronaut aren't really, they're in the same space in that there's people involved in both communities. The reason why I put this on here is actually because the most recent episode of the Groovy podcast was an interview with Graham Roche, who is the, invent, the founder, the inventor of Micronaut, and he gave a really nice uh, overview of what's coming next in Micronaut 4. He also went into some detail as far as how Micronaut compares with some of the other AOT frameworks that are out there, like Quarkus and so forth. So if you're interested in some more technical information about that, uh, this, the most recent edition of the Groovy podcast has a really good episode. And that's it, so thank you. The QR code there should be a link to my slides and the description there has a link to the, the uh, GitHub repository that has the code that I didn't have time to show you. Um, so uh, you get a picture of that or whatever. This will help you uh, track down uh, those resources. Uh, I'm happy to hang around and take questions. I don't know how much time I have before the next speaker um, and I wanna be very, very sensitive to that. So looks like we have, okay, I got 15 minutes. So. Um, 
I'm here. If you guys have questions, I'm happy to, to take them. Um, but that's it for the talk, so thank you. Yeah, please. Uh, when you do uh, white code generation, do you drop it out in the file system somewhere? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, mind if I show you? Yeah, All right, let's do that. Let's do this. The question was, you know, can we? Was you know, where does the bytecode actually go when we? Uh, I'm hoping okay, just turning off the screen share, uh, turning on mirroring so we can see it. So if I bring up the application here, and I'm going to try to zoom in. So we're using Gradle here, so it's going to depend a bit on your build tool. But if you look in the build directory and you go to, is it under generator or is it under classes actually? I think it might be under classes. There they are. Okay. So there's our hello controller. This is the, obviously IntelliJ is gonna try to you know, decompile it for me. This is the controller that I wrote. And then this is the definition, the bean definition that um, Micronaut generated. And there's a few other things that are made there just for storing various bits of metadata. So obviously this is not intended for humans to, you know, to read directly, but you can, it's all right there. Um, and notice it's all in the same package, but our controller has got basically nothing that I didn't write. So there's no transform going on. There's no monkeying with your, your bytecode. Uh, this can make uh, stack traces a bit easier to read because you're, the exception is actually ha happening in your code, your source, instead of in something that the framework has modified and you don't recognize all oh, the line numbers are off now. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where you can see them. They're all in that uh, build. And it's gonna be a little bit different in Maven. I, I don't use Maven myself, but it's, uh, this is uh, where you can find it in a great old build anyways. And also along with those lines, um, I, I have Swagger, and this, this is my demo that has, what is it not? No, this is the demo I wrote earlier. Let me um, bring my other demo up. It's more full featured. Because um, I showed you how, uh, how, how to de generate uh, Swagger documentation. So if I go to my build directory here, this is the, the code, by the way, that's in the GitHub repository that's got more stuff in it. It's more interesting. It's got the GitHub client. It's got some streaming stuff going on. Um, if I go here to build generated, uh, let's see, I'm looking at the right place here. No, classes main meta inf, there it is, swagger. So right here is my YAML file. This is the swagger definition. So Micronaut, I didn't really add anything. I didn't add anything beyond my code. You can add annotations. Swagger has annotations to add like descriptions and examples and all kinds of interesting stuff like that. But just by Micronaut reading, analyzing my code, it was able to generate that there is a uh, detect that there's an endpoint for GitHub releases and it should return a 200 response, and it uses this content type, and here's what its schema should look like. So this was, it read in the object that I was returning and created an open uh, API schema. All that happened for me at compilation time. And I could improve on this and make it even more readable, more friendly, but this is pretty good. And um, actually, since you're still here, I'll just run this real fast. Let me make sure the other one's shut down. Uh, yeah, it is. I'll run this real fast here just to show you that, um, this is the example that has a little more going on than just the hello world endpoints. Application's up and running, so I'm gonna go over here now, and if I go to swagger-ui, turn the zoom off a little bit. So this is what the user interface looks like. So Swagger is the tool that builds this based on my open API spec, and I can go ahead and uh, interact with any of my endpoints here. So I can try it out, click execute, there's a response that worked. Take the GitHub releases. This is supposed to, supposed to pull back a streaming JSON list of the GitHub releases for the Micronaut project. Now that I'm gonna see an error here, it'll still work. Uh, it's just, I don't think Swagger supports the JSON stream. Um, oh, I think it did work. Oh yeah, can't parse JSON. So it's confused, but it does show all the releases. They all came back. So that's all, you know, I, that was, this HTML was generated for me at compile time as well, and I can actually uh, inter expose this and interact with it. Great for you know, public facing APIs or just to give you a start for API documentation. So that's all the open API stuff. That wasn't your question, but I just got into a role. Is there a way to signal what the name out front is? The, the name out, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was actually all configuration uh, as well. If I go to app source, main resources, application YAML, that's where this is all set up. So. The resources themselves are available on, on the, on the, in the meta inf, so one of those generated directories. Uh, this mapping here is what tells me where it's actually hosted. And, and you can put this behind security as well. I just don't have time to set that all up, but it's all just configuration. <laughs>